It's a privilege to stand here with Luke Diamonds. I hope this conversation will enlighten a little bit the, the uh, work of Luke and also talk about different things that are important in the development of uh, the work of somebody who, in a way, redefined uh, the notion uh, of painting as a discipline which is not uh, auto-referential, but something that opens much more to many other questions and questions that deal mainly with the uh, status of the image in the contemporary world. Uh, I think that one of the, the most uh, important um, thing that, that somehow defines the work of, of Luke is precisely this relationship between the painted image, uh, memory, and also the, uh, the, the way we look at, at pictures and the way we deal uh, with images in, in our society. And in that sense, it's uh, interesting to notice that Luke was uh, uh, from, very, uh, from a very young age uh, started as a painter, but for a period he somehow uh, dwelled into other uh, disciplines, and I would like to show an image. So, so actually, I, I stopped painting from 80 to 85 because it was too tormented, too existential. Uh, I also think there were a lot of romantic notions about artists being an artist, which are completely stupid. And so this work, there's a very suffocating element to me. And by accident, a friend of mine actually shoved me a Super 8 camera in my hands and from there on to Super 16, in eventually nearly 35 millimeter with a crew, which was too expensive. And uh, so some bits and parts exist. What you're showing here actually is actually indirectly related to that. This is, this is when I was about 24 years old with a beard. And it was a, a friend of mine, the one who shoved me the Super 8 camera in my hands was Johan Heestermann, still a friend of mine, who was an actor at that time. And we did actually a reenactment in, at the seaside in a very important building, which is called the Palais des Termes, which is a hotel built under Leopold II, also at the Thermal Institute, in which I would actually do the very first show in 1985 with my paintings when I came back. But anyway, what's the most important thing is that through working with the camera, working with the lens, looking through the lens, I eventually got the necessary distance to make an image, because up until that point, as I said, it was too uh, too existential, too tormented, too, too close in a sense. You need distance in order to, to, to make an image. And also an element of detachment in a sense. And that's what actually this film adventure gave to me. I also want to say that there is a very big relationship between film, and I'm also a child of a television generation, for example, and uh, much more a link between film and, and painting for me. I would always be a very bad photographer because I would be too late. The photographer is in the moment. And the filming and painting are, have a lot to do with the idea of the approach of the image. You can actually edit even in the lens if you'd like, and you can, of course, overpaint. So this is a little bit the concept, context in which this actually appeared. In a very early statement, in 78, yeah. so you were quite young, 20 years, he said, in my paintings, I'm either becoming, or I am already very old-fashioned. With 20 years, you were saying this. There's no innovation involved. Everything is conceived in advance. All that is unknown is the moment when the authentic falsification is made. So this, this notion of falsification of the image, uh, which is very precocious theoretically here, uh, in a sense, prevails in your work. Would you agree with that? Well, it, this was a, a very young statement. I was, what, 18 years old, something like that. And also very well aware of the fact that even in the academy where I was studying, I mean, painting was getting a little bit outdated, like looked upon like an antique. And so I had to find the concept to prolong its existence, and I came up with this kind of infantile, ridiculous, regressive idea 
of trying to make paintings that would look like 30, they were painted 30 years ago. On the other hand, what's really interesting right now, because we are talking about fake news and what can you still yes. believe through social media, it becomes very dingy. So in that sense, already there and then, there was this very notion of distrusting the imagery profoundly, which I still do to this very day. And I think that's really important because that makes people think. So, so in a sense, uh, this was preceding the idea of the deep web, but with other means, which is actually the anach anachronism of the painting itself. Uh, and so actually the first image you showed, uh, which is 2017, which is also the poster child for my show in Venice, in the Palazzo Grazi, which is quite interesting because it's, uh, of course, a city in total decay and an element of extreme perversity. But that image, for example, is not a real face. It's not a real portrait. It is a, a projection of a face on a doll. And it comes from a Brazilian sitcom called The 3%, maybe some of them, some of you have seen it or not, in which people are invited, I mean, especially a group up until 31 years old, has the chance through tests to actually uh, make it to the other side and become part of the privileged society. And most of the people die in this test. And this image is particularly one of those things where they have to guess what happened to the woman who was actually poisoned. So, and I called it 2017 because what happened in 2017 is rather insane. I mean, we have the backlash of Brexit. We have Trump, who is president of the United States. So this is kind of like, I mean, completely out of place in a way. So, mm -hmm. so that was rather shocking. That's why the title is as such. So this, when I, when I, when I lecture, I, I show for the first image I always show is this image because uh, somehow it, it has this kind of depth that is lacking uh, nowadays in terms of the relationship we have uh, with memory uh, and the relationship we have uh, with history. And I think this is something that, that has been quite central in your, in your work, being someone who, who, who was born after, after the war, uh, nevertheless, this kind of European uh, uh, trauma is uh, uh, very well represented uh, in your work. And in that sense, it's, it's quite strange that we have a, 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 some, a kind of feeling that history uh, couldn't repeat itself, but somehow it does. It does. And, and the days we are living uh, make, makes it even more urgent in a certain way to have this broader uh, political view on, on art and painting. And it's, it's very interesting that I think it was uh, Helen Molesworth who said, who said, it's interesting to think about Luke Diamonds not as a painter but as an artist, which widespread to other other responsibilities, not only to the discipline itself, but to the positioning, ontological positioning of, of being an artist. So uh, how, how do you deal with these questions of memory and seeing how memory is so uh, organically treated uh, and also with the question of the fake news and so on? Uh, it's still a very, a very poignant uh, issue for sure. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I want to point out, this is maybe what you can do later on, but I wrote a text about 20 years ago, which is called On the Image, for uh, highbrow uh, academic sort of art historians, uh, newspaper that still exists, uh, The White Raven, and when I finished it, the head chief editor said, it's such a great text, did you write it yourself? So, and uh, the thing is, this, this text is quite interesting because it deals with the static image, it deals with the moving image, and it deals with the symbiosis and an epilogue which goes into the internet, which is actually quite accurate if you would read it. I'm not going to talk about it, but you can look it up on the website, go to my name, and you, cl you click on the image, you get to the four pages, which I think is, would be interesting also for the colloquium because this is actually what we're living right now in a sense, which I was thinking about 20 years ago. So the idea of history is not that I perceive myself as a history painter as such, and I also do not see Gerhard Richter as a history painter, but I do, of course, have a great respect for, like, especially one group of work that we made, the October group. 
And when I did, for example, the Monte Kitoko series, which was in the biennial in 2001, I immediately was bombarded as a political artist, which mm -hmm. I think is not possible. I think life is politics. I mean, every interaction we have is politics. Art is not really. So in the, but that doesn't mean that art cannot have a political stance at a certain given moment, but at a certain given moment. So going back in history, what would be the first political image that you could come up with, which was actually hidden and not shown at the time that it was made, because actually the person who made it was saving his neck by making it, which was actually Goya, who painted two paintings, which was the uprisal in Madrid, and that was after the facts when the French left. Mm -hmm. And of course, Las Tres de Mayo, which was the execution painting, where you have the X form and you have the very first political statement in art, which went all the way to Manet and also on. Or Jeff Wall, for that matter, also, with his uh, room, that uh, the, 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 the destroyed room, destroyed the, room yeah. the, the very first light box 70, that he actually, yeah. actually made. So, in, so there are, uh, nothing is really uh, that extraordinary. I think a, a lot of things are rather evident. I never believed in, in art being uh, something like, uh, a muse or falling from heaven or esoter esoterical bullshit or no, nothing like that. I come from a country where we did not have time to do that because we were always overrun by foreign powers, so we had to survive. So in that sense, when you come and talk about my region, then we are rather unforgiving when it comes to that idea of the painting model. So <coughs> the very, very first painting model, and for me, till this day, the most powerful painter in the Western Hemisphere, just because of the unforgiveness, is actually Jan van Eyck. Mm. By heightening the real, he actually sort of, as a person and as an individual, they took the first step to sort of devoid the idea of the imagery, which was like the mimetic imagery of Christianity, and he opened it to the globe. And this is, was, is, is an extreme concept because of the fact that it's dealing with realism. And I think that is the main core of where I actually come from, and also the painting that presides it in a very first sense, and also opportunism in a, in a way. But so all these things already are historical. I mean, if you talk about painting, you are, it's embedded in society. I mean, I still remember in 85, there was this guy who won the, uh, 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 an award with the World Press photo, and he actually, this was during the conflict in Eastern Europe. And he actually photographed uh, a mother with the, 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 the son who was shot. In his, and the mother had the son in her lap and he blew it up life size so it became what? A pieta. So mm. these, even if painting is no longer so called in the center of the art world, it's in the periphery. And so it is the very first concept that you can actually make, be it a cave painting or whatever. And also, you can work, I've made a lot of murals that disappeared, for, uh, the whole body of ephemeral work that I did because of pragmatic reason, because the people couldn't uh, pay the transport or whatever, so then you can actually, but you can work actually very fast, fa much faster than any other technique that you can think of. So in that sense, it has a high flexibility. In terms of memory, it is very difficult to memorize a painting because it's so extremely detailed. The trace is a physical trace. Hmm? So, and if you would compare it with a photograph, you would remember the photograph differently than you would re remember the painting, even if the painting is derived from the photograph. Because all these elements and these traces are omnibus in their detail, in a sense. And this makes the static image, when it's painted, in a way gives it a certain type of flexibility, mental flexibility, and also thinking about the fact that nobody's consciousness or memory is adequate because nobody can completely remember everything. So this is where painting starts to become very interesting and also dangerous in the way that it also works on you through memory, through time, over time, with time. It's a slow medium. And still to this day, I mean, first of all, it's the, very, the most expensive artifact on the globe still. And in, 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 in a way, it also has this impact on people. Uh, although it's not really interactive, it's very interactive because, of course, for me, the last person who finished off my painting is the spectator. Mm -hmm. And I had once a very interesting critique in Moscow when I was part, take part of the Bayano that one of these Russian women, I think, critics actually said that the importance of the work was the measurement of the distance between the image I created and the spectator, which is an interesting proposition. 
the measurement. Yeah, the distance. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> um, I'm reading here uh, also another quote about this, these questions where you state that, uh, I'm quoting now, every static image depicts its own vanishing point from the very moment of its creation. It is always finite and precisely for that reason not reproductible. Mm. So the image can do nothing other than absorb, soak up and fade. Mm. However paradoxical it may sound, the static image can in this way be infinitely more powerful in the memory than the moving image. So these relations between painting and of course the relation between photography and mm. painting which has been so decisive in the 19th century and, and so social, with such a social impact. And then with film, and with film we have to integrate narrative into this question which, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting because the way you, in a certain way, uh, uh, edit narrative mm -hmm. in a painting is completely different from the way that you, when you mount a film and you have a narrative, or mm -hmm. narr narr narrative behind it. And also a very interesting point that you make, made several times uh, in, your, in, your, in your texts, which is the difference between film and television, being yeah. television a signal, so the memory of the television image is somehow closer to painting in a certain sense because it creates a kind of non-narrative uh, memory in itself. Yeah, and also you can, with the remote control, you can pause the image. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, which I find quite interesting. Because, I mean, of course, you live in a world with a multitude of imagery and, and a sort of multitude of accessibility, so, which is yes. created... And we have to talk about the internet also. With, yeah, nowadays. which created yeah. a great deal of, of, of paradoxes, which were to be foreseen, because, of course, the internet is controlled by people. And that's what people forget. I mean, when it cropped up in the United States, the Americans thought there was no necess necessity anymore for a political consciousness because everything would be on the web, which is, of course, a pipe dream and not true, which we are living the consequences right now. And not to say in the least that social media are becoming the most dangerous thing on the globe. So in a sense, what that means is that there has to be an, an opportunity and choice. And choice is the, the element of choice is the most important thing in the, the decision making. Otherwise, you will be leave, left in a uh, sort of bowl, you know, like this, where the same people will converse with the same people, where every information will be abbreviated. I mean, people will look, binge watch Netflix and don't read a book, where people will get really stupid by the minute, so in the sense that they do not have the sense of analyzing anything anymore. So in this sense, the anachronism of media is quite interesting if you come to see it as a modem operandus in the system. Because it, and I did a whole show for that, it was first called Against the Day, which was also based on Dylan uh, Thomas, you know, the American writer who invented paranoia. But the whole show, because Derek Snower didn't have the money, so to make 22 paintings which were all derived from things either set into a pose, things taken from uh, virtual reality, things which were still under construction, on websites and all those things, and turned them into paintings, which was an anachronism, but quite interesting. So in a sense, I never understood, and I, I don't understand the fight, I mean, you shouldn't fight new media because you're not going to win it. Hmm. So the best thing is to incorporate it into the toolbox. It's not a problem. It's not that the world is totally virtual. The world is virtual, but also real. So you have to make the balance. And I think this is the, maze, the most major element. And so, and there's different forms of, of, of pictorial elements. I mean, the film can be having a pictorial element. And if you think about uh, Pierre Wieck, uh, the human mask I showed in the Baroque uh, mm -hmm. show, which was a, a video of a film actually he made of, of a monkey wearing a mask in the, in the destroyed uh, region of Fukushima. I mean, the monkey used to work there serving the customers and was completely fucked up because the whole situation was, of course, destroyed. The impact of that specific image becoming a monkey, a mask, close to a person, what a person can do to nature and its consequences are so appalling that that has a specific pictorial element. So, or we can talk about David Lynch or Hitchcock and the, the physical intelligence in film, which is also a pictorial element. So these things are not that clear. I think whatever medium an artist uses, he has to use it in a very specific way. 
And this also goes for the web, and this also goes for social media, this goes for the entire toolbox. If you don't do that, you actually are no longer deriving any meaning of anything. So you're just trying to, to, to it becomes a very conformistic point. So, so this is- Informal, formal. Yeah, but addiction, addiction. I mentioned that word also in the text, in the very last word, the idea of how people become their own pornographer because they become interactive within the imagery, within the media, and of course it becomes addiction. When we, when we, or when we talk about edition and of course, uh, and choices, mm. uh, it's it's very it's very crucial to an artist. I'm I'm for sure uh, the 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 way he positions himself within a certain tradition of painting in this case, but also within uh, he, the level of contemporaneity and whatever goes on in the in the in the world, and. In this case, this, this uh, yeah. painting from 1990 is, is very interesting because it somehow uh, relates to uh, a theme which is crucial to you, which is the, the representation of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also it intervenes uh, in a kind of uh, a mnemonic way also in terms of uh, history and, and and uh, and memory, and this iconic body, which somehow relates to the, for me, it relates a little bit with the the, the, the question of the Luftmensch, also the, the 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 body without a dimension, the the Luftmensch, where how Nazis treated the the Jews, also, and and it's it's this kind of of uh, lack of corporeality, uh, which is very. Uh, Disturbing in this painting in a certain yeah. way, and also this these entries of some something that could be put inside the, yeah. in the painting, in a sort. So giving another dimension, but not with the not with the artificiality of, of you know uh, perspective, for instance. Yeah, well, this particular painting was based upon a doll that I actually owned as a kid, and which you could open up with a zipper and then stuff it so it becomes alive. I also, and this is what you don't see on the projection here, is actually rather corporal, very physical, because I also use the medium underneath that makes that you get like juvenile crackers, and, and so you had the element of cloth, but also porcelain that was cracking open. And of course, you have the immediate sense of the idea of scarification, which is the two lines do that, because they take the place of the face, in a sense. They become a portrait instead of a body. It's also sexless, I mean, it has no genitals. I mean, it could be female, but you're not sure. So this is the clear choice of going for an idea that, although it, of course, creates its own element when it comes to a psychological assessment of an image, it is rather detached. It's actually the idea to start from the object, which is a little bit dystopian in a sense, but in a way, I think, interesting to do so because, again, it opens up a different uh, revere of possibilities. But this painting was a painting that was really made in an instance, in a way, because it was actually completely failing when I was painting it. And I threw it through my little studio and then took it back and just by doing two lines, which is these lines on the side, that it actually started to function. So that it's one of the very few chance paintings, in a sense. And it's quite an iconic painting. It's a very small one, it's like this, mm -hmm. I suppose. But it's, it's very interesting because uh, people many times wonder how the, the, the processes of the painter uh, develop. And in a sense, I, I, from what I, I've read, you talk uh, uh, about the space where you paint, where, where you, you can somehow Im imagine a confluence of many different images found images, photography, images from, uh, that you have in your head, also from film to commentary, etc. And, and this editing process, which somehow uh, <coughs> we can relate also to, to, to film itself, mm. uh, can depart from a, a real image or a total constructed image. In yeah. So it's a, it's a, but normally you paint, you're, you're, you paint 
it's not a very long process. It's one day. One day you paint. You, can you talk a little bit maybe about this, well, this question? Well, first, first of all, before I start to paint, the most gruesome period is actually the months ahead before painting is to figure out what I'm going to paint. Mm. Working with or represented imagery, for me, it's important that I know what the signifier is, what it means. Mm. Not that anybody else should know that, because I don't really, that doesn't really matter. You can see other things in it. I mean, it's not going to force a specific maybe through somebody's throat. But the most important thing is to have made the analysis of the imagery. Also in terms of its pictoriality, if it's possible, because not everything is, you cannot paint everything to a point. And when it's completely analyzed to that, that will be the point where I decide and to paint the painting. And that goes very fast. But it also takes a mental preparation. It's not that I paint every day, it's maybe one day in the week a little bit past the half of the week, mostly Thursdays, Fridays. And then I'm extremely nervous, like people that have stage fright, uh, and nervous that it will fail, because the, the in, in ultimate fear of the artist is that he will not long, or no longer be capable of doing it. That's basically the stupid infantile fear, which should remain there, in a sense. When that's no longer there, you become a process artist, and then it becomes like a mechan mechanical tool, and this is where you lose the intentionality. But when I paint, I don't want to think. I mean, I'm not like Leo Rauch once said that he thinks on the canvas, which I don't really believe. But I mean, the thing is that uh, everything is there and it has to be done. And the very first three hours are like hell, although I know it's I've been doing it for more than 40 years. But then when the first contrast actually starts to fall in, because I work from the lightest colors to the contrast in the end, then the imagery starts to fall together. And that's where actually the pleasure starts, because you can do things that nobody can see with the naked eye, but really important for a painting. And so it's at that point that I actually, the intelligence goes from the head to the hands, which is a different intelligence. There's two types of intelligence. And this is where I need this sort of circumcised idea of a day to this is also my attention span. I mean, people are limited. <laughs> and just to accept these limitations, but within these limitations to go very concentrated and keep this intentionality. If that's no longer there, I mean, for example, I could paint technically, other th repaint things that I made. <laughs> but eventually, if, you're a, if, if you have a sort of gut feeling about painting and the visual, any spectator will see immediately that it's no longer intentional, that it's the copy of the copy. And so you... And, and in that process from, from head, to, head to hand, uh, when do you feel that the head, the, the hand did the job? When it does something that I actually had to figure out. For example, every painting has to be figured out. Although, you know, we have pilots that land, and every time before they land, they have to still figure out how they are going to land. It's a little bit the same. Or it's the surgeon who is doing the operation. It's a surgical thing, mm -hmm. in a sense, for which I have great respect, because it's the same, the same sort of extreme. And it's concentrated, and it's even more scary, because you're dealing with a human, real human life, in a mm -hmm. sense. So I always compared it with that, with the surgical element. And I think th this makes it even more present, it makes it even more powerful to a point. And, uh, and so the, when it happens, it's that, that like, uh, for example, I don't mix colors beforehand. I just do it organically, which is important to get the right temperature, warm, cold. But it always came like that. I mean, it's just not that something that's what premeditated. It was also not premeditated. I was going to say, okay, I'm going to make a painting in a day. No, it just came about as such. There is still an organic process. And the moment it really starts to work, it's kind of an amazing thing because I, there's still things that you cannot completely explain. And when a painting works, I'm still actually still shocked in the sense that it actually worked to a point. But it only works when it also entangles the element of failure. Mm. I mean, the failure is an ex important element as there always has to be a weak spot in the imagery which makes it possible for the spectator to penetrate it. Mm. 
Uh, and so these things are the main elements. And they're sometimes rather unexpected and very stupid. I mean, there's like, you, you oversee them because they're so self-evident. But sometimes the things that are right next to you are the most, I mean, interesting. So, so this is something you have to figure out during the process. So it's a very intense, also very lonely, but an intense uh, process. But for me, it's also a pleasure. I mean, if I wouldn't have a pleasure of doing it, I would stop, I mean, because then it doesn't make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, in, that, in that sense, it's interesting, and I have here, <coughs> I have here a look time. <laughs> this is a, a, an image, it's a Polaroid, which is um, no, a copy of a Polaroid, mm. which mm. is in the catalogue of the 2006 uh, exhibition that Luke Toymans did in, in Sraus, the second exhibition, we'll, we'll talk later about this, in Casa de Sraus. And it's interesting that you mention also uh, very often that you, you're very interested also in, the, in this transformation of the images in their specific specificity, that mm. is to say the Polaroids, they lose color or uh, a painting can gain some, certain, certain mm -hmm. kinds of, of different uh, aspects <coughs> and so on. So it's this kind of floating uh, and passing of the, the, the images that is also concentrated in some of your paintings. No? Yeah. When you, for instance, pass from one Polaroid to painting, many times you have this kind of transition also. No? Yeah, so it's also the element of, 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 of light uh, that plays a role, in a sense. Uh, and, uh, I mean, so, so Polaroids I started to use in 95, now I do less, I just actually just use on my iPhone or even alter things on the, on, the, on the computer or whatever. Or, or make a maquette. All, all these things were always sort of like in the making. But it always had to be of a very flawed quality. So it should never be perfect. So that, that's the most important thing. So uh, I still work with the study paint I started with. I mean, also aquarellists like Talens. I don't work with Winston Newton because it's too much. It's too good. It, 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 it needs to have these flaws in it in order to give you this space and this possibility to actually work from. Now, Polaroids are quite interesting because they're not photographs. It's an emulsion. So when it actually sort of develops itself as I, as I make a painting. It goes from very light and then actually, through time, actually darkens in terms of the contrast. So it's actually a very painterly and accidental uh, pro process, uh, so which you cannot really control completely, which I think is but the, the beauty of Polaroids. And actually also with the iPhone, because it's still low quality, so in a sense it's, it's this, this, this element that actually the sort of inconsistency of the imagery that triggers the pictorial to a point. I think that this is how you also can incorporate a numerous amount of techniques in order to, if you have the vision or the mindset to join them up in their incompleteness, because this again, as we talked about with terms of the memory and trying to memorize things and the incapacity of it all makes sense. And then that is how the puzzle actually comes together. So in, in this sense, I mean, and, and the, another example that I can tell you is that I, I think it was in 2008 or so that I won the, the, the Max Beckmann Professor Prize from the Stadel Museum in Frankfurt. And they wanted me, of course, they had to do lectures and I had to work with the people in the academy, but I also had to make a show in the Stadel Museum. And I went through 5,000 works in the collection and made my pick of it. But I also had to put one of my uh, paintings on, in the museum, in one of the museum spaces, and I took one of the 19th century, uh, because the first memory was the, the beautiful painting of Fernand Knopf they had, and, uh, and Max Liebermann. And then I showed two paintings which were against the day, which is also in the show in Venice now, which you see actually a friend of mine, a colleague who I just put in my garden, shoveling in the ground at night, with a cap or something, with a tree. So it could be a very 19th century, I mean, hmm. idea, I mean, of, of imagery in a sense. But once it was there in the space with these paintings, it was digital light. So you see, 
immediately a different, a different light source. Mm. And that, that's, you cannot get away from your own time, it's, even if you want to. I mean, the contemporarity will slip in to the imagery nearly unknown. So I think that's a fascinating mm. proposition there. It's, no, let's pass that out. Let's see two, two paintings. Sorry, this gas came <laughs> from 86 and the other one before. This correspondence, yeah. Sorry, In the, the other one before. Silent music. Yes. Yeah. And correspondence. And, and I wanted to approach a little bit the question of uh, architecture, mm. uh, decoration, and trauma. In a sense, uh -huh. and and how public and and uh, private spaces, uh, and how the the painting can depict some some kind of um, site specificity. In the case of gas can, yeah. for instance, it's somehow a painting that you did for a certain context. Yeah, but Which is the, 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 the gas chamber is, of course, the most metonomic painting ever because without the title, it's just a stupid seller. But also in the day that it was actually used, and this particular image is based on a gas chamber, it's not a replica, but the one in Dachau, which I actually went to visit, among other concentration camps, but and on the spot made, uh, it was a calendar in the in the hotel, and so the, the so the, the back of the of the calendar was paper. I, I made a watercolor on the spot, which was laid, laid around in my studio for eight years or so, till it completely yellowed, and then I decided to make this painting. Up. Now this is a very problematic painting, and will always remain a problematic painting because, of course, you're dealing moral issues. You're dealing with the how do you position the idea of the image of death, destruction, horror, and all that, by not completely showing horror, but you show the space, which I thought was a much more powerful and much more, yeah, metonymous and, and, and difficult. And also to incorporate the object because the drawing had, the paper had yellowed, so that also was sort of intertwined in the image. The image was also, put on a frame that is not straight. This is all on purpose. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, there is an element of warmth. There is also the idea of skin, which is yeah. incorporated, and the element of decay instantaneously. So all these things were a concept in this particular image. So it's a very conceptual image, I mean. And, uh, and in that sense, it's, it stands a bit alone in, in, in a way that still for me is a problematic image. And it took a long while to break through the taboo because it's a taboo image also. So these, these are all these particular images and I think it was shown here in Sir Alvis in the bedroom, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the paintings you've just shown were shown here in Sir Alvis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the villa. And then yeah. this one. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. Hmm? Yes. No, this one is then. Uh, the opposite, it's, it's, it's the idea of, of homesickness, this painting, mm -hmm. which was based upon a writer, Van Oudshoorn, who was a Dutch writer who was based in the Berlin Embassy from 1905 to 1910 and didn't have money to, ha to have his wife come over. So every time during lunch he went to this, and there was this, of course, the 19th century, very elaborate, you know, in, I mean, decor and all that. And he just would buy a postcard and would, with a red pencil, cross on the table where he had eaten and send it to his wife during the period of five years, which is insane in a way. Pre on Kawara. Yeah, <laughs> sort of. But, and so I turned it into a very clinical situation. I used the wallpaper. This was also the first idea of creating transparency in the field of painting. I mean, so he could look behind and through things, which is right after the film experience, actually. Also, Right after film image, I tried to sort of enlarge decoupage drawings I made for the film because I was fascinated by how you could render a drawing in painting because a painted line is not a drawn line. So it's, it was a very, uh, so nothing is spontaneous either. So it was like really a construction that looks spontaneous but isn't in a way. And so this idea of transparency was very important that way. 
Uh, I don't know. Which is, yeah, this, yeah, this is called silent music. So, so I also give titles to my works. I mean, when I started to show my work, that was not done. I mean, people didn't give titles. You know, people didn't also really talk about the work because they were. I mean, it was much more the idea that okay, the work will speak for itself, and the artist will stand in the corner and once in a while say something intelligent, which, of course, didn't work. I mean, and I also started to show the, 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 I mean, I did, I don't know how many galleries in Cologne alone, 86, even with a dog, and it didn't work. So, so then eventually I, I went to a colleague of mine who actually, Mark Schieber, still has a space. Morgan was my very first uh, show in a sort of gallery circuit in 88. And this was a, a space that mostly showed, he was also an artist, uh, post-conceptual art. So it was very important uh, to talk about the work because the idea of contemporary art is kind of interesting. Up until the 70s, it was kind of nice and everything was uh, with a lot of, you know, like it has this, not a bohemian, but it had this sort of leisure element to it. Then, of course, the markets made it a bit difficult. But at a certain point, I still remember seeing shows of artists from, who worked in the 60s in the museum and they show a lot of work. And then you go one level higher and you come to the more contemporary and it becomes like a very cool wind that goes through it because it's all contextualized. So this means that Bertrand Brussel in 1964 was right, that we have not become only democratic in our, outmost, in our outward forms but in our inmost convictions. So there is a social blackmail that is entangled in all that. So therefore, being very well aware of that, I actually talked to the journalist and said where the words the, word, the image came from, so they at least know what to write. And then, of course, later on, they said to me, if Tarman doesn't talk about it, we can write about it, so it turned it into arrogance, so it's never good. <laughs> so in a sense, but this was a necessary step in order to hmm. bridge the situation of which I was very well aware. So, and therefore, till this very day, when somebody ask the question, why do you still paint? The standard answer will be because I'm not fucking naive. So this is the main thing because painting is the first conceptual image to date. But you can, every, every, I mean, a lot of artists, I mean, you give it to Stan Douglas, people, uh, I mean, I'm also David Lynch, who's a filmmaker, and now again paints. But a lot of people start their artistic career with the pictorial experience, which I think is an important embedded situation in society, and not the least, in a sense, because it makes you think this is the very first conceptual image. It is also the first element where you create a symbolic capital, I mean. And it's exclusive, which is, because of course, it's also man-made to a point. It's, it's interesting in this image, for instance, is how at a certain level it's a very candid image and also the, the colors you use, which are not represented here <laughs> by any means. But, but somehow this candid image, how, how it can be, uh, or how there is a, a, a kind of violence which is, which is so palpable also. And, and this is something that, that happens a lot in your, in your work. Mm. Uh, and this, this level of, of violence has some kind of cathartic uh, end or, or is, is just a statement of how things are? It, it's a mixture of a, a lot of things, I suppose, also. It's a mixture of emotions. And I mean, this particular image I'm coming after showing the gas chamber is, again, an empty out room. But it's also a room that has been preconceived for the child that has to be born. So the child has no choice. So because the parents actually decided upon the fact that pink and light, light blue is like the ultimate idea of the children's room. So in a sense, it becomes torture when you empty it out. So, and therefore, the title Silent Music, which has nothing to do with the image, because sometimes there are titles that have nothing to do with the image, but open up another image or another idea. And that's why I keep on giving titles to things. Sometimes it's just description, sometimes it's the opposition of it. I think that's important because there's also the element of language, of course. And the element of language in terms of trauma is exquisite, in a sense, because it's uh, 
very derogative, and it can also sort of be very treacherous in a way. And yes, of course, the idea of the distrust of the imagery is constantly there. The fact that things can change within 30 seconds, that things can start to move in 30 seconds. Uh, these are all things that were also given in even by my mother in terms to say that uh, everything is okay, but you know, in 30 seconds it can go pretty wrong. So this, 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 these things were embedded also in my youth in a sense, and also propelled themselves indirectly into this structure, which was a bigger structure. And was proven to be right, because it's very difficult to believe imagery today. And in yeah. 98, you did uh, the exhibition with Miroslav Balke here at Casa de Sal, so it was the mm. first time you, you showed in Porto. And, and it was, a, a, I would say, one of the most poignant dialogues with the house itself, which is, has, <laughs> has its own history. And, and in that sense, do you feel that your painting is also, or, or can be also, uh, uh, a very architecturally linked uh, yeah, form of, of art. No, that the, is to the, say, the beautiful thing with this particular show uh, I did with Miroslav first, Miroslav is a sculptor and I'm a painter, was first of all this dialogue, which was very intense and, and very much between the artists. I mean, was because the curator actually got sick, so in a sense we had to figure it out, mm -hmm. and which was beautiful, which was great and also a fantastic opportunity in, in this villa. I think the museum is still under construction, and so. Yes. So it was like a very weird process. But it was also one of the very first times, not the very first time I show my work was in an empty swimming pool in the Palais de Terme, which was an Art Deco building, which was very important for me because I had a very small studio at that point, which was crammed with imagery, and that was, and it, it all went wrong, I mean, I sent out 5,000 invitations. My mother went and it was in the basin of the swimming pool on the ledges where the paintings were and some on the wall. And so she started to cry. And then some friends came. But at the f when the, f the evening was falling, I was on the balcony looking at it and I said, it's gonna be fine. Because I could see for the first time from a certain distance the work outside of the studio. And which was more important, not in a white cube. And this is the same element now in the Palazzo Grazzi, which is not a white cube either, or Wales, who's not a white cube, or the, the villa was not a white cube. And strangely enough, the work works very well in the non-white cube situation, mm. because it sort of turns around the domesticality of it and mm. turns it into something very weird in a way. And I think this is always the challenge. And therefore, I, I'm not a, a, a great defender of changing spaces or making theatrical spaces for paintings, but the painting has to be strong enough to withstand uh, the, the environment. Therefore, I also nearly never hang a painting unless it's impossible to do otherwise in the middle of a wall. I would hang it either to the right or to the left. It will find its spot. It will go against the architecture and therefore work with it. So in this sense with Miroslav, this was extreme because you had two elements of installing and we were all, we were extremely meticulous about it and so used the entire villa as, as a real uh, uh, dialogue but also a part of the, the show. different spaces of the villa. In all these spaces, contexts. yeah, yeah. And I mean, that was a great experience. Mm -hmm. But that particular space, that the, the, the painting and the fence, mm. this was the most problematic space. We had broken our heads about it, and we didn't know which kind of work from both sides we had to fill it. So we said, okay, we're gonna make a new work, which we then also donated to the Fondatio. Because there was no other, this was a, a, a sort of transitional space already mm. in, because you have the door, you have the hallway, and then this is, is like a, a bigger... Not the image here, I'm huh? sorry. Huh? This is not the image, image from the exhibition. This is in the museum. Yeah, it's in the museum, yeah, but I mean, but... It's not in but, the But in, yeah. in this place it was, was actually it with was the barbed the, wire the, and the barbed then, 
they had this Christmas man, and then the, the Miroslav threw the soap into the fence. Because this was also the, the real entrance of the villa, the, the main entrance, because you normally you now come up to the side. And so it was a very representational space. And, but we also did this, we also went to look at all the furniture and all the old photographs of the villa and the whole history, which is quite precocious in a way. So it made it all and all more and more and more interesting. <laughs> so this opens up also a, a kind of a relation to political issues which are concerning your, your country and uh, <coughs> the colonial, <coughs> colonial past. Uh, and it's interesting that you chose the Venice Biennial to, to address so specifically these contexts. Uh, can you tell, tell a little bit about uh, the way you were thinking and the process that led to this, to this exhibition. Yeah, but th th this, this is the most journalistic uh, body of work I've ever made. And uh, I actually made it out of a fascination with one of the former kings, Baudouin, who was very young, who was a very yeah, traumatized king because his mother got killed in a car accident when he was very young and the father was a sort of uh, king that tried to be despotic and was a political idiot, basically. But I mean, so the, the thing is that out of this king the, came the king's question, and at 18 years old, this person was pushed by the father and actually installed as the king. And in his 20s, his early 20s, not even married, he actually went to the Congo, which was the first time a king went to the Congo, but also to the people of the Congo. So it was a very emotional trip. And there was a rather racist film that was made by André Couvin, which is called Moana Kitoko, which is a B, which is not true, because Moana Kitoko with an M in Congolese, the other thing is, means ruler, but that's Swahili. So that was propaganda, but actually he was called beautiful young man in Moana Kitoko, because he could not be perceived as a chief because he had no children, he was not married, and so on. So that was the sort of drama of that king. And then you have the other figure, you had the antagonist, the protagonist, and which was Lumumba, which mm -hmm. then, of course, uh, the whole situation with the murder of Lumumba. And you had the pavilion, in, uh, which I didn't know, but I found out that the pavilion was built by a colonial architect, so what better place to show such a thing than there? in a situation which is completely politicized, because, I mean, uh, the Venice Biennial is about national mausoleums. It was a gift to the, the, to the Italian king, and it still is a political thing. So, I mean, so most of the people reacted very, uh, well, were, were quite intrigued with it. I mean, most of the Americans, the Germans, the French hated it. <laughs> so, because the French, because of course, didn't, didn't allow the little Belgian country to have also a political history, but anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the thing is that it was very typical, but in, in a sense, I could have done a sort of other thing. I could have said, okay, I'm going to show some choice of 30 years of painting, but this was the imminent chance. And that's why in the show, in La Pelle, in the Palace Classic, these things will not be shown because they've already been shown in the proper place. Mm -hmm. So this type of topicality will not be there. Now, the image you see is one of the images of that show, which was made from a Polaroid that I made when uh, my wife and I went to the cinema and we were having a drink afterwards, and I feel something gazing in my back, and it, I turn around, it is a bar in Antwerp, so not, nowhere near it in the colony, of a polychromed sort of a pygmy, was looking at you, and so I took a Polaroid of it and painted it. And this was quite difficult when it was shown in the United States because, of course, of the African Americans that said you cannot, as a white guy, portray this and so on and so on. I had to explain it was not a real person; it was a sculpture, and it dealt with all the elements that were eroticizing, also in the way the black person and so on. So this was already a problem. Tricky. But, hmm? Tricky. Huh? Tricky. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. But, but it was an, uh, an, an important point of how we perceive the other, in a sense. And the idea was to, by the gaze, to throw that otherness back to the spectator. This was the main thing of this particular image, the sculpture. 
This is also a very interesting image because it's, it's this kind of image where you, of course, as a viewer, don't recognize the, don't recognize the space. There is something strange, like this altar in the center of the room. But then when you, when you know that it, ha it has to do with, uh, with uh, an image of a surveillance camera, mm. then it gains also another another dimension. So this is a space that you, you would, as a non-Mormon, never exceed. No. Uh, so it's a space you only know through the, through the, 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 footage. the channel of a, 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 a surveillance camera. So it's very tricky also. Can yeah, you, it's, yeah. It's, 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 as I said, <laughs> a, an image that's completely, constantly attending itself through this surveillance thing. And this is the, the, the altar where actually the Mormons get married in the temple in Salt Lake City. So. Uh, got interested in the Mormons because they have the most enormous data bank and they actually just make it bigger by people who are dead. So it's a little bit of go goal story, so it becomes like this huge thing. And so I got interested and then started to look into this and that's one of the images that came out. Uh, well, this right. is uh, just a... Uh, an appointment of the material that was that is in the catalog of the 2006 exhibition in yes. Sahalj, which is in a way uh, an exhibition where you expose yourself and to to the limit, let's say, in terms of the process of the work and how and how these uh, these conditions come to foreplay in terms of uh, constituting uh, an image. So this is just an appointment of that and. Maybe. And this image is a, a, an image of a show you curated, Sanguinia, and I would like to address, uh, I would like if you, you could please address a little bit the, the idea of being a, an artist curator, which is uh, interesting in terms of the differentiation between the regular curator and the point of view of the artist as a curator, and, and also linked to the question of how looking you know for 40 years of your own work when you do a individual show uh, how this balance between a curatorial stance and and some kind of uh, specificity of the show can can also make you your own curator yeah well well the, first of all the works you see here actually this is a work by my wife, Carla Rocha, and her partner, who is uh, Stefan Schraal, the Circa Tabak, which was important in this show as a modem because it actually reflects and sucks in all the imagery. You have Marlene Dumas, you have Armleder, you have Thierry de Cordier, Jutta Cassone, and Crosby. The, so it was a show about the Baroque that I wanted to make. Actually, I. I have to say, of course, I never instigated the show. They always asked me to do a show. Mm. So, so then, if I then agree, I mm. try to do a good job. But there was one show in particular, the, let's go to the very first show that was this very first experience which still stayed with me and was an extreme experience, uh, very intense, with a colleague of mine, a painter also, Narcisse Tordoir, which was called Trouble Spot Painting in 1999. I think you might still find the catalog, I don't know. Which was a show which was done in an artist cooperative which still exists, the NICC, the New International Cultural Center, which was founded upon the fact that the ICC, the, the International Cultural Center, was sort of like they took it out. And then artists squatted this specific place, which was the royal palace of the king in Antwerp. And out of that, a whole organization came, like nationwide, we made an organization of artists mm -hmm. and we had a uh, get together on the, on the south, on the big square, and founded the NICC. And one of the things was, first of all, also at a certain point, we decided to create and curate shows. And this show was in the spaces of the NICC and in the museum. The Muga, but the entire museum, because actually I had a show in Bonavante Museum, but I was also programmed, because it was a Van Dyck year in Antwerp, in the Museum of Contemporary Art, which I didn't know. So, <laughs> so I couldn't be at two places at the same time. 
And out of this, this sort of... Difficulty. No, no, not difficulty, but just, 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 this is very has, haphazardly, we then decided to take over the whole thing. And that I did together with Nassis Dordoir. And the idea was to make a show about the problematization of painting. And that's why we call it trouble spot painting. And also the difference between the two, dimensional, the two dimensionality of painting and actually Heliotiska, where it will go into the space. So we had like Richter. Or Heli with contemporary artists. Yeah, Heli yeah Heliotiska. But you also have John Baldassare, you had David Klarbelt, you had Pistoletto. But you also had like a juxtaposition between Ugo Rondinoni, Kerry James Marshall, resonance of, uh, let's say, Eve Klein, Ellsworth Kelly. So you had all these elements in this show, which was, I think, quite an interesting show. And with very young artists also, uh, that were all dealing with this idea of how painting could do the second part that we wanted to make, which we didn't, didn't get there. But now there's two new artists that will prolong and do a su successive uh, show about this trouble spot painting, but then now. Uh, together with the NICC again, because it still exists. But our idea was then to make a second, uh, a second show out of it, or something that prolonged it, departing from performance and from going from performance into painting. So it was a very thorough idea of visually analyzing, and we had so much fights. <laughs> At the end, we nearly hated each other. Uh, but we got this done, and it was a, it was a really a hard ride. Which fights between you two or so, between, between the artists? No, between us two, with us artists. Because the one that you didn't like, Chris Ophelia, you wanted to put it on the street and things like that. And so, so we had all these things going on. But eventually we delivered a really great show, and it was a great experience. I mean, for me, it was like to see resonance in the space with two paintings of Kerry James Marshall was like, Jesus, I mean, this is really starting to function. And so it was a real kick. And therefore, also the fact that, uh, that, that you work with somebody else's work. Then the other kick was when you work with people that are dead. Like uh, I did a show, uh, the very first China project, uh, which I did in 2007, was a show with, with, with uh, traditional art from the southern part of the Flanders, because in the 15th century, Belgium didn't exist yet. I mean, Belgium is very young. It's 1830. It's one of the youngest countries on the globe, I think. And so, so but we had Van Eyck, so we, and that was in conjunction with Dr. Yui from the Palace Museum in the Forbidden City with Chinese old masters out of the same time slot. And first shown, actually, in the Bazaar and then in the Forbidden City, which was insane. I mean, to, because of course then that becomes a different way of curating even, uh, going to look at uh, the, the only drawing of Jan van Eyck, the Albergati in uh, Dresden, in the Kofferstich cabinet and so on. So, so uh, out of that then the second volume was with contemporary art together with Ai Weiwei, which was interesting because I needed a bully after the first Chinese experience. So. So that gradually there was this sort of critical mass that sort of developed itself. And also gradually it was getting more and more famous and the art world has became more and more corporate. So in a sense, as a very famous artist, you become extremely isolated. And in order to at least create some data and some critical mass, this is, was one way out to create this curatorial practice which of course is very similar to the way I create my own solo shows because of course there's a preference mm -hmm. with one difference. If you do it with contemporary artists, since the fact I know a lot of the contemporary artists and I also know a lot of the younger artists, I can react much faster than any curator. The power is bigger because I have a direct line mm -hmm. to the artist. Like when we did the trouble spot painting, I just phoned Robert Gober and I phoned Pistoletta and yeah. they just came. So whereas yeah. if you are a creator and you have to get a work of Robert Gober from a collection, you have all the bureaucratical and all the other problems that will... Yeah. And it's not that I want to take the job of a creator because I think it's a very valid job, yeah. but it's just that... Yeah, the, the, and this is also maybe the problem that institutions sometimes, in too many occasions, ask 
uh, well-known artists to do it because they will solve their problem, which I also think is a rather mm -hmm. difficult situation. So it's not that. But of course, like in this case, it was the Baroque year and it, there was a problem because they didn't know what to do. So. And this was much more a plumber situation. And so the, the very first thing I had in mind because was to have two elements, which was the five cars that which I would get myself, and Caravaggio, the David and Goliath, which in the far end I got for the show. I got the other one for Antwerp, but the far end I got it for the show in the Prada Foundation. So the thing is that this whole experience of, of putting meanings together is also an element of responsibility towards the community you live in, in a sense. And also to make clear to some institutions that they actually can function when they actually apprehend the idea of the visual more profoundly as a signifier. This is where it all comes in. And in this particular case, of course, living in a Europe that is like going dire straits in terms of populism, to divert it with a different form of populism, which was Baroque, but then went into the idea of a globalized vision of Western image building with a certain element of propaganda, of course but nevertheless, the opposition of what we're sort of living. So it was kind of an interesting antidote. And also a show that you do in Europe, which is also important. So this, all these elements then come together. So this is your last show. Well, which part is, of it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> which is now in, in, in Italy. And it's curious that you decide to transfer to another medium, one of one painting, one yeah. painting. Schwarzheide. Uh, Schwarzheide. Yeah. And this is done with uh, how do you call it? Mosaic, the Mo real as a, as pieces a mosaic. of marble. Yeah. Yes. With an Italian company, the Fincantinis <laughs> in Milan. And I decided to do this because uh, I mean I saw I saw the, the, the two other shows there, but especially of course also the show of Damien Hurst with the gigantic sculpture going through the roof which I didn't necessarily dislike. I thought it was kind of, I luckily saw the show first, because it was in two parts in the Palazzo Grazi, where it sort of functioned, and then in the Punta del Lugano, it went into overdrive and it just exploded. But, of course, this is one type of monumentality and this is another. And I actually wanted to make something that, you can also walk over this, that you would have the idea it would have been there forever. Mm -hmm. so, is the turnaround of the modern mentality. When you go up the stairs, you incarcerate it in the wall, have one small painting, so you get this huge mosaic, which of course has a signifier because this departed from an image that has to do not with a dead camp, but with a labor camp in which actually the Detonese made these drawings, ripped them uh, off in, in, out of scare of being detected, and then after the war, you have the incomplete drawing. So what I took, with me is the environment which are the pine trees and the lines sort of symbolize this. this. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an image of death in a sense, onto which you can walk. So, <laughs> so, and that's what I think makes it interesting because it's not that overpowering as the sculpture that takes over everything. It's because it already sets the tone in the scale and the going in reverse in terms of monumentality, which was also the idea of the show to go under the skin, I mean, to go into the understatement, which I think is highly necessary in the day and age we live. And if you do that properly, because this is a specific responsibility, because you have the largest audience during the biennial when you have a show there, so you also have to give them the possibility, and I always made the point that one should never, ever, and this is a rule in life, over or as underestimate anything or anybody. It's a major thing. And this also, I was also always opposed against wall texts in shows. Mm -hmm. So what we did, we made a reader that we give to free for everybody. And then at least the visitor has the chance to just look and maybe then read or to read and then look. But at least the choice is there mm -hmm. for a visual pictorial sort of uh, experience. Yeah, because it's becoming very complicated in museums that you have all all kind of yeah. text accompanying the image. And Panofsky once said it's, it's terrible when you have all these texts next to a painting because people just 
in, in Caravaggio, they talk about chiaroscuro and they say, ah, beautiful chiaroscuro. Mm. They don't think about anything else. So one sentence ne near to a, one painting can determine yeah. uh, the whole way you look at the painting. So I think we are more or less in time, but I would, I would like to, to leave a challenge to you because we have so many, I think, students. Mm -hmm. And in a very short thought or sentence, what would you say to the young art students who are st starting to think about a career? Well, I, I actually would say good night and good luck. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I have a grave respect for youngsters who want to become artists because it is much more difficult than when I became an artist. It's far less transparent, it's much more complicated, much more information also. A structure which is a very, as I said, a structure that went corporate already. Uh, so you're up to a lot of shit. So in a sense, I think the artist will have to do three or four times as much as I had to do. That means nearly organizing everything, basically. So. If you have the conviction of becoming an artist, I, as I said, uh, good night and good luck. I mean, this, it's, uh, it's a, but you need the conviction. I, I also believe that this is an important thing as an element of resistance within a society. And, uh, but I'm very well aware, I mean, and, 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 and this is not just now, but this is going on for a couple of years already. I mean, just to make your stance as an artist, it becomes very complicated. As I said, in my day and age, it was, of course, if you were not privileged, I mean, I did many other jobs to survive and all that, but the landscape was different. It was uh, a landscape right before the art market installed itself as a proposition, which it has now. I mean, this was a result of the 80s and the Yuppidum in New York where the Americans actually had the Japanese overpay real estate, which created a bulb and an opening, and the very first painting of Schnabel was connected to the stock market, and that's how mm -hmm. the art market, as we know it, mm -hmm. then sort of arose. With the Gulf War, a lot of galleries went broke, and pretty important galleries in New York, but the young ones, like the ones I started with, made the entrance, and the machinery was installed. So this is, this is what you're all up to. I mean, I mean, when I started to work in my gallery in New York, uh, there, was no, there was the very first five artists, one assistant, now 25, 26 years later, it's about 350 people. Yeah. So in Hong Kong, three, the three uh, uh, galleries in, in New York, London, it's a huge operation. So that means that five, six, seven large operations, uh, I'm not going to name them all, will decide upon what culture will be for the next 20 to 30 years, because the 1% who buys that art and who is in the board of trustees will decide what will enter the museum and our illegible legacy. That's already one of the main things you're up to. So, so in that sense, to create a difference it's not going to be that simple. So, but it's vital. Huh? But, it's vital. but it is vital. That is, it's vital that there are things in the middle. Mm -hmm. There is vital that there is diversity instead of uniformity. And these are, and this, this, I mean, I never set out to become a rich guy just by making art, because then I would have done something completely different, and we would have never had this conversation. Mm -hmm. So, because in order to get rich, you don't only need tunnel vision. And it's not necessarily that British people are really intelligent or cultivated either, by the way. So if this is a choice you make, and this choice is an intentional choice. That was my point of departure. Luckily for me, I'm from a younger generation, so when I grew with all this tuition, and so therefore it will not backfire on me like that. But for a younger generation, imagine if you are a young artist and you're taken up by a superstructure that is enabled to brand you, and you have any type of intelligence, you get scared. Mm -hmm. So this is, these are all things that you have to take into consideration. 
So the way to success is not the way, it never was anyway, the way to success was never important. Your conviction is the main thing. I mean, you can learn a great deal in art school, but you cannot learn how to become an artist. Mm -hmm. I was chuffed up, uh, chuffed out of every academy that you can think of in my country. And so the, the paradox is that now we're talking in front of people who are sitting So the element of the autodidact is also an important element, but the flexibility, how this institution also gathers information, but also gathers information that is ongoing because you live in a world that is surrounding you. And a lot of the ed art education is, in my I think, very, I mean, it can only be subjective. I mean, I can go to a studio of an artist and say what I think, but that's my opinion, you know? I mean, so that's, I cannot really make a science out of that. Nor can you do that with art history. I think it's very, I mean, hypothetical still. But that makes the possibility in the society to create a zone which is non-determined, which I think is something that it should remain. That is the freedom that art gives you. Thank you.